Welcome to Floating Floss. In this video, I will show you how to make floating cotton candy with the one-of-a-kind RoboJet Floss cotton candy machine. You can watch this video at any time, but before proceeding to use the machine, please make sure you've read the owner's manual and preferably also watched our previous video, the basic setup and operation guide for the RoboJet Floss machine. And with that, let's start making cotton candy. So to start the process of making floating cotton candy, we assume you've read the manual and watched the previous video. You know how to set up the machine, unlock the deck. Obviously the first step is to add floss to the bowl, give it a spin, get it centered. We're going to power up the machine and adjust the temperature. I've already preset it for 75 volts because I've determined that's about right for this environment. We're going to use the snow control tool just in case uh, we get unwanted snow production and snow in our lexicon simply means uh, the beginning stages of a cold start where we get flecks and bits of uh, floss that aren't uh, cohesive enough to be able to collect on a cone and they tend to litter the environment. Outdoors that's not a problem but indoors uh, it can make a mess which can be cleaned up but the less of it the better. So I'm going to fire up the machine here. It's going to spin at 3600 rpm pretty quickly and uh, when it warms up we're going to spin up our first cone and I'm going to go through the steps of making a single cone and, and then how that would differ from making multiple cones. But starting with the snow control tool, spin up the machine, wait for the aroma uh, that tells me it's ready to produce. I'm going to watch for snow being produced. In fact I'm going to let a little snow come out so you can see what we generally want to avoid. Uh, but the best bet is to start with the control tool to capture it. It's really just a screen mesh. So you can see the snow being produced and you'll see when it starts to be uh, airborne why we want the tool in place if we're in an indoor environment. Uh, as soon as I let a little bit of it in the air I'm going to cover it though so I don't make too big a mess indoor. And usually when you see it being produced you can lift the cone a little bit, you can test, set it back down, lift, test and you can find the optimal time to actually start making your first cone. Now this is really only important from a cold start. Once the machine is warm, you can go into full production very quickly. So snow is really only an issue at a cold start and then sometimes at a shutdown or when you're running out of floss in the bowl. Now right now the camera is hopefully capturing the snow. All right, now I'm pretty sure it's capturing it. So I'm gonna cover this and this initial floss isn't very good quality. You can see these are just little bits and flecks. At this point, it looks like it's close. I'm going to wave the cone underneath. Yep, I can capture it. So now I'm actually making cotton candy. So as I can, I can raise up and capture the candy high. I can move down. I can capture it low. You'll find that if you're trying to avoid making a mess with snow, the closer you work to the bowl, not touching it, but just a few inches, maybe six inches away, you'll capture even most of the snow. So when you're in a warm-up phase until the machine is good and hot, work kind of low. Once you've got a good steady stream, I got my hands in there, then you can work at a higher range and, and the, the cotton candy will stay together. Now, the point at which you think you're done, which is entirely up to you how big of a cone you want to make, the uh, single serving method says that, well, you can either turn off the temperature or you can simply turn off the machine. If you turn off the machine, it's only going to spin for just maybe five seconds and uh, production will cease obviously. A multiple serving environment would be a little different and, and usually once you start making the cotton candy if you're in a crowded environment you're typically not going to make just one serving you're going to be making them serving after serving after serving. So here comes the snow again but since the machine is warm it's only going to make it for just just an instant. Didn't have time to cool down. So as we uh, start up our second cone Realize that in, in most instances, you're going to simply switch from one cone to the next. So, as I'm making my next cone, let's take a more typical example of cotton candy production. That being where I am actually going to just shift from customer to customer, or if I'm working with an assistant, making them off and handing them to the assistant. So in that situation, I don't need to ever really stop the machine except to refill floss. So when I get to the cone to the size that I'm ready to make a serving, which is usually bigger than this, I'll simply switch a new cone into place. Uh, there are times where I'll even make two simultaneously. For example, you have uh, siblings or two customers, I guess whether they're related or not, and you're, you're making two for the same customer set, and you want to make sure that they're somewhat equivalent in size. You can 
switch it back and forth and this gives you the advantage of making the servings comparable. So ordinarily this is the way production runs. You just make cone after cone after cone until your floss gets low. Now when your floss starts to get low and you can see inside the bowl and be able to tell when that's occurring, at that point you have the ability to either turn the machine off and uh, do a complete refill. You can do a fill while it is spinning fast, but the problem is you, you run into the potential of the sugar flying everywhere. So I like to do what I call a pit stop. And with a pit stop, what I will do is I will uh, turn off the machine and as it spins down, I'll kill the power. And just as it about gets to close to, to stopped, I will then move in and add floss. So I don't let it get to a complete stop, and the reason I don't get, let it get to a complete stop is as I put the sugar floss in, the slow rotation helps balance the sugar out for me. So I don't have to touch the hot head and manually balance it. It also has the advantage of not letting the motor cool down, so I can go right back to immediate operation. So I call it a pit stop because it's sort of like a race cars that barely stop, they switch the wheels and get going. Now you of course can shut the machine down entirely, let it cool down for a few seconds, add floss, manually spin the bowl, but it will be hot so you want to be careful when you do that. I like to fill it, like I said, kill the power as it gets to a very slow rotational speed, add my sugar there, that allows me to use that slow rotational speed to disperse the sugar and self balance it, hit the power, and if I'm doing it right it never actually gets to a complete stop. I hit the power and I roll right back out of the pit and I'm back to making floss. Really no snow production, no loss in time, and I'm right back on the road. Again, whenever I'm ready to actually stop, I can either just turn the machine off, but if I am going to stop for a period of time, it's important to understand I don't want a hot stop like that. What I do want instead is I want to turn the heat off, let the floss finish producing, and when you do that, you might get snow at the tail end. So if that's the case, have your snow control tool ready again. And am I going to get snow? And snow production, by the way, depends on temperature, it depends on humidity, it depends on a lot of things, so you never really know. But if you start to see flex, put the control tool on. Now the heat's off, the motor's spinning. If you're going to walk away from the machine for any period of time, you don't want to just turn it off. Now I'll turn it off, fill the floss, turn it right back on, no harm done. But if you are going to let the machine set, you definitely want to turn off the heat switch and let the motor run, and this will allow the coils to cool down quickly. This is important because if you just turn the engine off and leave the full hot coils in contact with the floss, two things are going to happen. One, that floss is really going to caramelize hard, and that can make future production difficult because if it hardens enough, it can actually be hard to liquefy again and therefore block the laser slits in the sidewalls and affect your production. And two, it, that, that crystallization can then start to smoke and um, it can make the future production, at least for the next couple of cones, not taste as good. And if you're in an indoor environment, you can actually create enough smoke, not to catch fire or anything like that, but you could actually, if a smoke detector were nearby, you could set it off. So if you're going to walk away from it and plan on turning the machine off for any period of time, let it run without the heat on for at least three or four minutes if you're indoors, which has been long enough now. Uh, if you're outdoors, you want to uh, typically let it run a little bit longer, five or six minutes, uh, assuming outdoors on a warm day. If it's a cold day, you might only have to run a, a minute or two. But if we're talking about a summer event and uh, you know it's, it's August, it's hot, uh, let it run longer. Indoor, temperature controlled, two, three minutes is probably fine. So use your best discretion. You can always tell if it's cooled down enough by checking the floss head. It's still warm, for example, right now, but it's not so burning hot that the floss is gonna to start to smolder and smoke, and it's not gonna caramelize real hard. So those are your options for making single cones, doing pit stops, multiple cones, and then if you're gonna do an actual shutdown for any period of time, kill the power to the coils, the heat source, and then let it run for a while to cool down before killing the power to the engine. So up to this point, I've demonstrated the uh, few techniques using paper cones, which are uh, very popular, inexpensive, compact, lightweight, lots of advantages to them. You can make a pretty good size serving on them as well. They're not exactly small. 
although when I'm using paper cones in conjunction with the other options, I call them my small. Uh, one of the other real advantages of paper is because you can only make a uh, you know, certain size, I'm not going to call it small per se, but they're not monster servings, um, that self-limiting nature means that if you've got to serve a lot of people in a short period of time, um, then that's pretty much all I'll bring. So for example, if somebody's hired you for a party or a social event where people aren't paying for their servings and you have to serve everyone, uh, for example, 100 people in an hour, um, then this becomes really your only practical option because you know, using like that two-handed technique I showed earlier, you actually can do 100 servings in an hour. Uh, it'll be a very busy hour, uh, but it can be done. However, uh, what floating cotton candy is really known for is making large servings. And for that, you're going to need some sort of a stick. That could be a plastic straw or what I most commonly use, uh, a wooden, wooden stick or a skewer. Uh, this, for example, is a bamboo skewer. You find them in, uh, typically you're going to want 5, 6 millimeter, something with enough heft that it won't bend. Typical length, uh, 20 to 24 inches long. I've worked with as long as 3 feet. Uh, longer allows you to make larger, but larger does get hard to manage and heavy, and uh, uh, so typically 20 to 24 is, is most common. So the two pro tips you need to know about when working with wood is that dry wood won't easily collect floss and you'll, you'll be able to start, but it won't get a good grip because it's too dry. So you'll end up spinning this inside of a very small collection and it will just free spin. So you, you won't actually be able to make a large serving at all. So what you do is you soak them in water, uh, get a, a tall, cup or container so you can have them pre-soaking, but you don't actually want them soaking wet. So when you take them out before actually starting, you want to have a rag, a cloth, something to give it a quick wipe down dry. So what you want is for it to have a lot of moisture content but not be really wet on the surface. Because if it's too dry, it'll spin, and if it's soaking wet on the surface, you'll make a little bit of a sugar water basically soup, and, uh, and then that won't stick either. It'll be too wet, and you have the exact same problem. So you want it wet, very moist, give it dry so the moisture content is there, the cotton will immediately stick to it, get a good grip, and you can uh, get yourself a, a real big serving that way. Uh, the second tip is when you start, and I'm going to do that now, when you start, you want to start very low to the floss head so that you can get all of those particles and quickly cover the length of the stick that you're going to build on and you want to get as much of that length that you're going to build on covered and nice and grippy and sticky and that allows you to make a, a larger serving uh, with a lot of grip or purchase area. So I'm starting up the machine, I'm going to pull out a stick, got a towel down here, give it a quick dry so that the surface is uh, moist but not wet. I'm going to uh, get the stick really low to the floss head and lay down just a little bit of traction area. You won't be able to see me do that, but I'm going to cover the length of the stick that I'm going to work with. And once that's done, and it's basically done now, I'm going to set down my snow tool. And now I can move up to a higher range where you can actually see the floss being collected. So it's the same spinning motion, but the only thing I'm going to cover here is just your shaping techniques. You can either just move up and down the stick and make yourself a nice cylindrical serving. Uh, what I often do, just to make it easier for people to see what's going on, is sort of an upright spinning. Uh, this is a two-hand spin. If I go really fast, I can force the collection towards the bottom of the cone and make sort of a hat or a pyramid shape. Um, I can get rid of that and round the shape off and make it back into a cylinder. And if you want to make it a ball, then basically you just move up and down, and when you get close to being done, you invert it and fill in the top this way. And that's how you essentially form it into a ball. So you just make a cylinder, add some to the top, add some to the bottom, and you can then rotate back and forth, and you can eventually make this into a, a fairly reasonable ball. Now, uh, I also want to point out that the texture and the way that this fills in is going to depend on the height that you're working at. As I move higher, you can see the uh, spreads out and gets a little bit looser in its uh, fill. And uh, if I work down low, it's going to be a sort of a tighter weave. So humidity and temperature really always affect the floss. So you really have to just experiment for the location that you're at. Uh, and then every location is going to be different because the te temperature and humidity are going to change. Also, the amount of airflow that you're allowing is going to change uh, the texture of the cotton being flossed. 
and the uh, the look of the work that you're you're providing. So, when you set up uh, your first couple cones, you sort of experiment with temperature and with uh, the flow that you allow in terms of air. And I could go bigger, but at this point, my fingers are actually getting tired. Not that the uh, floss is very heavy, but um, it's like spinning a bicycle wheel. As the weight gets out from the uh, circumference, it, uh, it gets harder to spin. And I, I would make it, honestly, I could make it larger if I wasn't trying to talk to the camera and pay attention to three things at once. But that's a, still a, a pretty good size serving. Most people aren't going to complain about that. In fact, I'm not sure if it's all getting on camera. I'll bring it back here. All right, now I think it's all on camera. So most people are going to be pretty happy with that. Um, and that's on a, a 20 inch stick. Bigger the stick, the bigger the serving you can make. This is a little fluffy, so it's hard to make it much larger because it doesn't have a, as much cohesiveness. Higher humidity and temperature make for a, a denser cotton candy. So if you're uh, outside in a summer event, you, you actually can make them, uh, you'll find you can make them much, much bigger than this. So uh, again, shaping, you can make them in a variety of shapes and um, the wooden sticks are really what make this machine famous because the, the size potential is limited pretty much only on your working environment and how long of a stick you have to work with. So we've talked about the uh, proper voltage range for sending power to the heating coil on, on a number of occasions and we typically reference between 60 and 80 volts as, as being the best range to work within. But realize that within that range, there's no one correct choice that's going to really depend on the environment you're working in at the time. The ambient temperature and relative humidity really change the output and texture and consistency of the floss. But still, I'd like to show you how changing the voltage and therefore the heat of the coil uh, affects the production of floss. So I'm going to start the machine and just work through a couple of ranges so you can see how increasing the power and decreasing the power affects the floss. But you can't write down that, well, at 70 it does this and 80 it does that because you're not in the environment I'm at right now. Currently, it's uh, winter. I'm indoors in a very low relative humidity and the temperature is about 68. So you, you, the setting I'm going to use is only applicable for this environment at this moment. However, the changes in the voltage regulation will be applicable uh, across the board, though not 100% because, again, the humidity is going to be a really big factor. So this is a normal production uh, at about 70. That's a good steady flow. You can see the width. I caught my hand at it. You can see the width of the... Uh, stream being produced is adequate. I wouldn't want to be producing much faster than this because it would be hard to keep up on a paper cone. You can handle faster production on a larger stick though because the uh, complete diameter and circumference of your cone is larger. Now I'm going to turn it down to 60 and I want you to see what happens to the stream of production at 60 and how long it takes for it to change. All right, so I've turned it down to 60. I'm going to strip the cone and start over. And you're going to see the stream get thinner and weaker. And I'm trying to keep it high enough that you can see. And so about now, you should be able on the video to see the difference. It is a much weaker collection, and that means I have to come down lower to be able to capture it. It's almost converting to snow. So now, I'm going to turn it up to 80. And for it to get back to a normal stream of, of good usable candy, it's going to take 15 or 20 seconds. We're starting to get there. It got so loose I've got to actually scoop the bowl to get it back going. But now we're there. And so that's probably about 20 seconds. Now at 80 you see this is even denser and faster than 70. And I don't know if you can tell, I'm, I'm spinning this cone much faster than I was. This is a much, much denser and faster production, which if I'm working with a wood stick, is, is, this would be what I want. This is uh, hard to keep up with at paper. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go one step further, and I'm going to overdo it. I'm going to go up to like 90 or 100. Because I want you to see when things go wild. And you're going to see this uh, stream turn into more of a rope. See how it's getting narrower? There we go. Now we've got more of a rope, and you can see I can still collect it, 
but it's no longer a stream that evenly disperses itself. Now this is handy, and I'm gonna turn the heat off now because I won't be able to keep up with it, not with a paper cone. This is handy for doing certain kinds of tricks that we'll cover in a future video. Uh, it's fun, you can, you can set it up and play, and like I said uh, in another video where I do some advanced tips and tricks, we'll go ahead and let the rope go, and you can see I've turned the heat off and it's still being produced. So this gives you an idea of that thermal lag, how long it can go on for. When people talk about the snake or the rope trick, they will deliberately turn the heat up a little too high in order to get this rope being produced. Still collectible, still tastes good, uh, but it, it changes clearly the way that the candy is produced. It's really useful for outdoors where you don't have to worry about making a mess. Go much higher than this and you will start to smell the floss being burnt and then you're in a danger zone, again, not because you'll actually cause a fire, but because it won't taste as good. Uh, and again, it will start to produce a visible smoke along with the floss. And if you're indoors um, and there's smoke detectors nearby, you, you can actually set them off. Uh, I have done that. So your voltage regulation, uh, that was last setting there was 100. Again, in low humidity indoors. So when you see the stream too weak, that means more voltage. If you can't keep up with the production, turn it down a little bit. If you need faster production, again, working with sticks or making a really large ball, turn your voltage up. And if you do want a tighter, more of a column or a rope, uh, more temperature will get to that. But make your adjustments small and wait 10 or 15 seconds before assessing whether that was enough or too much. And so that's where voltage regulation affects the output, the speed, and the type of consistency of floss that you're going to produce. But again, remember, you can't just assume that, well, 85 is where I'm going to get this because the ambient temperature around you and the relative humidity also have a very big effect on the floss production. So your first couple cones of the day for any location that you set up in, that's going to tell you what the settings are going to do. Thank you for watching the floating floss video, all about how to use your one-of-a-kind RoboJet Floss cotton candy machine. At this point, you should pretty much know what you need to in order to take full advantage of the RoboJet Floss in making cones either one at a time, multiple sequential cones, making small servings, large servings, basic shaping techniques, enough to get you going on your own and creating your own style. You can use this machine for mass production or custom creations. Uh, there's really no limit to the different things you can do with a RoboJet Floss. We'll be making more videos in the future, but hopefully this will get you going and on your way, and I thank you for watching the video.